All right. Welcome, everybody. I have a very special guest with me, Mr. Eric Oliver, who is a local trumpet player and respiratory therapist here in Albuquerque, who has done so much stuff here in town and other things that we will discuss that I, uh, as part of this project that I'm working on with interviewing local trumpet players, I had to talk with Eric because Eric and I go, Eric and I met when right after I retired from air traffic control and I had the opportunity to play in the pit orchestra for dream girls here in Albuquerque. And that's when I met Eric. So Eric, welcome. Thank you very much for doing this. Well, Michael, thank you very much for having me. So, so I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, you I know you're from Albuquerque and you graduated mm -hmm. from Manzano high school. When did you graduate? I graduated in 2000. Okay, so who was your band director at that time? I don't remember. Bruce Crokin was my. Oh, band it was Bruce. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. So yeah, Bruce. Bruce, such a nice guy. Um, yeah. And then from from Manzano, you went to UNM, and you were yeah. at UNM, and you graduated from UNM. What year? Uh, I actually didn't graduate from UNM. I went from UNM from two thousand to two thousand six. And from there, I uh, got the gig playing on chips. Oh, oh, okay. All right. So now when you were at UNM, you worked with, you were part of the jazz band and you were part of the music program. Were you mm -hmm. majoring in music at that time or were you majoring in something else? I was majoring in uh, music at that time. I was a jazz studies major. Well, I, I bounced around a bit as I think a lot of young people do. Started music education and then went to, performance and then went to uh jazz studies and then uh got a gig so yeah <laughs> which which we're we're going to talk about here just a little bit because that's such an interesting yeah. topic so from now you had said to me when we were doing when we were spending all that time in the pit you had said to me that you got to study with quite a few people, including some names such as Roger Ingram, Wayne Bergeron, and stuff like mm -hmm. that. I, I bet studying with those guys was absolutely amazing to, I mean, the, the things that you learned from them had to be just just stellar. Yeah, yeah. Um, both both uh, Wayne and Roger were pretty amazing experiences. Um, and both required a, a bit of work um, to uh, to get lessons with them. It was before um, the internet was quite so ubiquitous, and you know, Zoom lessons weren't really a thing. Skype lessons weren't really a thing yet. So um, a lot of those lessons involved me driving to Los Angeles over a weekend and crashing on a friend's couch, and you know, finding how to hook up with those guys you know they each had their their websites that were pretty young at at that time and having to i think wayne had just put out his uh first cd and when you bought his cd off his website you could put in a comment and so in the comment i was like i'd really like to get a lesson sometime and he actually emailed me back so that was that was pretty cool so how, how long now, uh, I mean, I'm sure it was expensive as heck, but so how many lessons per se did you work with Wayne or did you work with Roger or did you just, was it just a weekend or was it more than one weekend? I think you said it was more than one. So both guys, uh, I got two lessons from um, and Roger charged, and this is in 2005, um, Roger charged $150 a lesson for like an hour and a half, and Wayne uh, charged $100 for a lesson. Okay. Well, that, well and, yeah, we're, <laughs> we're talking 16 yeah. years ago, almost yeah. 17. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I know that you can spend a lot of money when you work with some of these high name people, but I'm sure the experience was worth every penny. I take it it was. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I used to uh, drive out to L.A. after classes on, on Friday. And, you know, then I was 22, 23, and I could drive to L.A. in one go. Um, 
and I would crash on a, a buddy of mine's couch who um, was in my cabin at Interlochen when I went to Interlochen. And actually, he's made uh, quite a name for himself now, too. His name's Daniel Rosenboom. Okay. And he's he's kind of uh, breaking into the scene there. And he was on uh, doing some studio work out there. He's, he was on the last like three Star Wars movies he played on and has his own method out now, although I haven't uh, yet had the opportunity to go through it. And just got to deal with Bob Reeves' mouthpiece doing this. The boom method. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Really nice guy. <laughs> that's, yeah. I, li I like the catchphrase. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I so, used to I used to crash on his couch when I would go out there. Okay. And and that was so so we're talking sixteen years ago and, and we mm -hmm. all know where Wayne and, and Roger have gone from there. And yeah. and you know, you're not you're not slacking yourself. I mean, you know, so I know you do, you do a ton of pit work. I mean, you are, you do a lot of work in, in the, in the, in the pit orchestras for all of our local musicals. And, and you just finished playing Mean Girls at Pope Joy Hall. Mm -hmm. So what was that like to finally get back in after what, almost two years? Because the last one that you did would have been the one that we did together, which was Dream Girls, right? That was uh, February that was of 2020. Yeah, yeah. So we had just finished um, Dream Girls, and I was in rehearsals for Oliver with uh, Landmark Musicals when things really shut down. Right. We had actually moved into Rhodey Theater, and we were doing uh, dress rehearsals. It was Tech Week when. You know, everything shut down, and that was the last thing that I was getting ready to do. Right. So what was it like to get back in the pit and play, especially playing, you know, it was great because I, I got to, I was there for the opening night on Tuesday, and I opened yeah. up the I opened up the program, and I see that your name is in there, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> yes! <laughs> that well, must have been awesome was, to be there. Oh, it was, it was really, really great. And, um, you know, I don't think I could have picked a better musical to come back to because it was just, so much fun and uh the pit orchestra was so great and the cast was so great and the crew were great and just everything was was awesome and so much fun oh yeah and it was a great show i i will tell you i sent you i said i think i sent you a text uh, on, yeah. on the intermission i'm like it sounds great <laughs> <laughs> and it did i'm glad it, it sounded good that was a long day oh yeah I bet because, you know, so so when you do something like that, I'm not familiar with this. When you do something like on a touring Broadway situation like that. So I'm, I take it they send you the music ahead of time and then you have like a week or so. And then what you have two rehearsals, one rehearsal and then boom, Tuesday night show starts. Why did that work? So for that one. Um, and so when I used to do this before um, I, in early 2000s, uh, I did a, a couple shows. I did uh, The Producers and Chicago and Hairspray when they came through. And this was before YouTube and, well, you know, YouTube was just getting started. And, and what they used to do is they used to send you a rehearsal book a couple weeks in advance. They would send it to the union office, you know, a big trunk full of rehearsal books that they would pass out. And a rehearsal CD, which was usually just like the, the piano accompanist for rehearsals. Mm -hmm. And you would just play along with that. Now what they do is, you know, everything's on a Dropbox that's password protected. And you can download your part uh, in PDF. And they have um, a camera on the conductor in the pit. And so they just record one of those performances and then they'll send you you know a video of that that you can play along with oh cool okay so how many rehearsals did you get before you guys opened on tuesday so we had a four hour rehearsal on tuesday and then we had a one hour sound check and then we opened that night oh god <laughs> Yeah. And that's not an easy trumpet part. So you had a four-hour rehearsal during the day, a one-hour sound check, and then you played a two-and-a-half-hour show. Yep. That's oh, right. boy, I bet your chops were complaining at you. 
Yeah, they weren't they weren't too happy, but that's okay. We got through. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, it was absolutely amazing, and and you know, I the show was was spectacular. I both my yeah. wife and I enjoyed it immensely, and I. I, you know, looking, like I said, you know, it was so nice to see so many local names that I mm -hmm. recognize, both Mark and Byron and all those guys. It was so nice to recognize all those names and to see that and to see your name on it and to hear such a great show. Um, I, my compliments to all of you and those of you that were, you know, if anybody's watching it, those of you that were in the pit, my compliments to all of you guys. It sounded great. Well, so, thank you so much. So, so you told me when we met that you did, and this, this trying to, you know, kind of get to this, because this, this is just amazing to me. You worked on the cruise lines. How long did yeah. you work on the cruise lines? How long were you uh, part of that? I did that for five years. Okay. That's what I thought. And, yeah. and that was, was it just one specific cruise or did you just bounce around? What did you do? So I, I bounced around quite a bit um, in those five years. I worked mainly for uh, celebrity cruise lines. And then I had two short stints on Royal Caribbean and two, like, three-month contracts with Princess Cruises. Um, normal okay. contracts would be uh, six months. Um, the Royal Caribbean ones were surprisingly very, very short, like, uh, three weeks where someone had to go home or quit or got fired and I would get a call from my agent in Montreal and they would say, we have a ship for you. You have to leave tomorrow. And, you know, I was in my late twenties at this point. So um, I would come home to visit family and not really have a whole lot else here. So I was able to just, leave the next day okay and so so that that was not i mean i i'm trying to remember the story that you told me you said though you guys had literally what mondays off and then from tuesday through sunday you guys were playing every week i mean how did what does mm -hmm. it do for those people like me who aren't very familiar with it so what is it when you're on a cruise ship what's a typical week for you so uh, let's say like a seven day cruise. We'll go we'll go with seven days because those are pretty pretty common. So on the first day is um, let's we'll use a Sunday through Saturday week. Although typically your your week is just um, like embark day, sea day, sea day, um, one port, sea day, whatever the port is. You don't even use day names anymore. <laughs> Yeah, because you it's lose just, track. <laughs> yeah, it's just uh, em Embark Day, Sea Day, Sea Day, Juno, you know, or whatever. I did a lot of Alaska cruises. So okay. Juno. Um, so first day would be Embark Day. Entertainment, um, we had a lot of opportunities to, to get off the ship because, you know, we'd rehearse for a couple hours a day and then have two hour-long shows at night. So we had a fair amount of free time. Um, so we'd go out into the port, call home or whatever. Um, most people still have flip phones at this point. So, <laughs> um, you know, come back, we do our rehearsal. If the band was established, then, um, rehearsal wouldn't take very long. It would just be a quick sound check and, and run through things. If we had a new member of the band, then, you know, we'd have to run through everything because, it's, it's unfamiliar to them. Right. And then we'd have two welcome aboard shows. Sometimes, depending on the line, it would just be one welcome aboard show to introduce uh, the new passengers to the cast and crew and um, the activity staff or entertainment staff. They call them cruise director, assistant cruise director, and, and all those people. Then we'd have a sea day, which we'd either have um, a guest entertainer, which could be... Uh, a vocalist, um, sometimes a juggler, a magician, a ventriloquist, um, sometimes instrumentalists, um, violinists, and, and stuff like that. We we tended to get a lot of um, people who play who played Broadway roles, like 
on the West End or okay. in Sydney and, and stuff like that. So people who would be like uh, the Phantom in London for a run or people who were Jean Valjean from Les Mis for a run. Um, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun for those guest entertainers. And they would come on board for a couple of days, do the show, and then, you know, go home. And then we would have maybe three production shows, depending on the, the size of the ship. And production shows were pretty standard Broadway-style shows, and they would be the same every week. They would be usually on formal nights where everybody dressed up as in uh, tuxedos and ball gowns, you know, and, um, our cast and crew, which were usually like um, uh, 16 to 24 people, um, okay. usually two female vocalists, two male vocalists, and then dancers, um, would put on a pretty spectacular show. And those shows are usually run by a production company based out of, uh, a lot of them are based out of Miami, some of them are based out of Nashville, some of them are based out of London. Um, and they're kind of contracted by the cruise ship to put on this uh, production and they produce the sets and you know the the script and the book and all that is shipped out so the cast uh of the uh, of those shows would usually have like a month rehearsal out in nashville or miami or london or wherever before they would join the ship and then they would install a whole new uh cast at one time it was very different than the band who, you know, might over your six months there, you might end up with a whole new band that went started. Okay. And so, so you were basically for the, were you, you were basically playing seven days a week? I mean, even though you had your free time, you were basically, you really had no, you said you had a lot of free time, but you didn't have a true day off. You were playing right. seven days a week. Yeah, we were. And you, yeah, it was pretty and you did this for five years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's you know, I'm sure, I'm I'm sure it takes, and, and this is this is I don't know how else to say this. I'm sure it takes a specific personality to be able to do that for so long and I, my compliments to you because you know did did you ever get I mean did you stop because you got bored or because you needed to find something else why'd you stop well actually I stopped because I was having a little too much fun on, <laughs> on ships and actually needed to, to come home kind of clear my head a bit and kind of change my lifestyle a bit because ah. um it is a, an on the road lifestyle, yes. and you know when you got a bunch of people in their in their twenties with um, exotic ports and cheap booze, it can uh, <laughs> it can get you into some trouble. Oh, I get it, I get it. So, so you and and I say this as a compliment. You are an amazing reader. You you can read. I mean, look, I remember that first day at Dreamgirls when when they said, okay, we're going to play this. It was the it was the final to the first act, and the lady who was singing the lead couldn't sing it, so they asked us to transpose it, and they put us in the key of, put us, trumpets, in the key of C sharp, and you were transposing it down, I think it was up a minor third into C sharp, or down, no, it was down a fourth into like the key of C sharp. And I was like, wait, how the heck are you doing this at sight? You are an amazing reader. Is this kind of using the cruise ships and stuff? Is that where you really learned how to read? I mean, read, read? Or was that always that something that came natural? Well, uh, I guess I had a little bit of a knack for it. Um, as far as transposing on sight, I, I owe a lot to my early uh, trumpet teachers um, who, when I was in high school, were, uh, were Bob Dorr mm -hmm. and, um, and Doug, uh, Doug Carlson, uh, who, you know, had me start transposing when I was like, you know, 16 in high school. And then uh, my teacher at, at UNM, Jeff Piper, you know, yeah. helped me learn how to, how to transpose a lot. Yeah. Um, but as far as just reading itself, uh, 
it, this does take me back to the cruise ship days. And at my very first week on board, we had um, big band night, which is one of the formal nights. And it allowed guests to be able to, uh, you know, do ballroom dancing. And so we had five one hour long uh, sets that night of just big band dance music that we didn't rehearse. It was just, okay, here's the book, pull these tunes. You know, um, my repertoire was not as big at that point. I learned a lot of tunes and a lot of styles um, working on working on the cruise ships, which, you know, are part of the Great American Songbook, but, you know, you don't learn as much of that as you think you would. Uh, Oh, yeah. And you still have to read. Yeah. I so mean, uh, a lot of those songs, which were classics, you know, I wasn't necessarily familiar with. I was 24. I thought I knew everything. But, you know, I really, I really didn't. And, you know, we, I had five hours of sight reading that night. And that really kind of, you know, throw me into it. You, okay. You learn it or, or you get replaced. Yeah. Oh, no, I get it. And I'm I'm learning that now. I mean, you have to be able to read. And yeah. I I work on it every day. Every day I practice, I put something up in front of me that that just is new. And I just try mm -hmm. to sight read. And I still I'm still fighting it. It doesn't come natural to me. And, yeah. um, you know, it's just a matter of reading. And, and I guess it would be different if you were playing big band books, but I saw you do it in pit orchestras. So, <laughs> you know, it, there's, it, it just becomes, it just seems like it's a, sounds to me like it's a combination of, you know, being forced to do it on the cruise ship and a lot of natural ability to do it. And some people have it and some people don't. And you seem to. And my compliments well, you to know, you on that. Um, I, I actually picked up some tricks for learning uh, sight reading from, uh, from Roger Ingram and in one of the lessons I had with him, um, he told he, of course, had a, a huge library of, of big band charts because he's played on a huge number of charts. Um, and he said when he was teaching himself how to sight read, he would, you know, go to the stack, pull something out um, and just play it. And he would do that every single day. And he would do it not necessarily at the tempo or style even that was in that, that was marked on the, on the music, but you know that way also he could he would pick a style and pick a tempo and and practice it that way so it would you know run him through everything. You're right. I I have to yeah. It's it's not an easy skill and it's a learned skill and it's something that we all probably all of us. Um, need to work on and mm -hmm. and that's just something that you know all of us need to do so so I have a question for you um, sure. it's it says in your resume that you did some work down at the downs of Albuquerque doing the call to the races is is, yeah. is that true did you do that live did you do the recording tell me about that because I have my own story for that <laughs> I you know uh one time, one one day, they had hired a uh, a uh, bugler for for the downs, and and they were actually bringing some guy in apparently who um, did it at you know one of the other big uh, big racetracks, and it was for for a special day, and we had races all day. But the guy apparently had a little mo too much to drink on the plane, and it had gotten. <laughs> belligerent and was kicked off the plane and and this is one of the guys who you know owned his herald trumpet and you know a, a get up and everything and so they needed someone to replace him uh somehow they got my number and i was free that day so i went and did call the post for you know a whole a whole day worth of races there Okay. That, that, that was it. Yeah, just a one yeah, time. But just a one day. Okay, because I did it yeah. when I was in high school. I did it for, I did it at the Downs of Santa Fe when the Downs of Santa Fe was actually open. And then um, I did it two years in a row uh, as a young adult. I did it two years in a row for the state fair. So I did, you know, all three weeks 
of the oh, state wow. fair every single day. And mm -hmm. I, I just thought I'd ask you about that because it's on your resume. And I'm like, oh, yeah. wait, I actually say I could do I did that. <laughs> Did you, yeah. did they, did they dress you up in the, in the boots and the britches and the red jacket and the helmet and everything? And they give you a no. triumphal trumpet or did you kind of just stand out there? I, I, you know, I just stood out there. I wore uh, blacks and I had my own, uh, my own horn. Uh, the Downs at, at this point, I don't think owned any of that. So it was, I think some, some tracks own the, own right. the costume and the, and the Herald Trumpet and all that. But uh, no, they didn't have any of that. They just oh, didn't okay. to, to come yeah. play. <laughs> yeah, I had, I, I grew up with horses. So I had my whole outfit that still actually mm. fit me at the time. And then oh. I borrowed the Triumphal Trumpet from Santa Fe Downs to do the State Fair one. And that was uh, always, you know, and it was funny because you had exactly 30 minutes. So you had 30 minutes from the time that you played it to the next race. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> it, it was it was an interesting experience. I got to see a lot of the state fair that most because I got to explore a lot. So yeah. it's just kind of one of those things. So all right, well at least we have that in common. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so <laughs> let's. Um, I know that your your main job is a respiratory therapist. You work over yeah. at uh, Heart Hospital here in Albuquerque, and mm -hmm. and I know these last few years have been like really really tough for you guys. Do you have any words of wisdom for those of us out here, you know, for, for, for musicians and everything else, any words of wisdom you'd like to pass on? Well, uh, you know, the number one biggest piece of advice I can get is, is if you haven't get vaccinated, you know, um, it's probably the easiest and most effective thing you can do right now to keep from getting, getting COVID-19 or, um, even if you do have one of the rare breakthrough cases of getting serious disease and, you know, unfortunately uh, dying from it. Um, it's been a rough two years working in healthcare. Um, my colleagues, both the respiratory therapists and nurses and the doctors and nurse practitioners and physician assistants that I work with, uh, they're stressed, they're tired. You know, a lot of us did get into this profession to help, um, but no one got into this to see what we've seen the last two years. The amount of people that I've uh, watched suffer, and the amount of people that I've seen die these last two years is like more than most people would see in a normal career. Mm -hmm. So it's been tough. Um, get vaccinated, you know, wear, wear a mask. I know that, you know, that's a, uh, it's a divisive thing, but those, those things help. And if you want to be a, a musician and, you know, continue to play and hopefully keep shows going. Uh, getting vaccinated is a requirement. I mean, we had to be vaccinated to play in the pit. I got tested four times over that week um, just to be admitted to play. Right, and, and you're fully vaccinated, right? So, I mean, mm -hmm. they so yeah. so you're fully vaccinated and probably with the booster, and yet you still had to be tested before and still end up being tested through the week so yeah. so it sounds to me like the moral of the story here is is you know um get vaccinated and stay healthy and, and you know and we thank you i mean i do i thank you personally and i and i know everyone else thank you for all the work that you've done over these last couple of years so so let's wrap this up here um i have a question for you so what's up and coming for you what you have anything on the horizon that that we can look forward to seeing you in seeing you play you know really uh waiting to hear back from the great musical theater uh companies that we have here in town um waiting for mts um Musical Theater Southwest and Landmark Musicals to really boot things up again so we can get going. Right, because I know that um, 
Uh, is it Big Fish that that MTS mm -hmm. is doing coming up? And I'm sure you'll yep. be involved with that. So we'll look forward to that. Well, I want to thank Eric for joining us. I want to thank you for uh, sharing some wonderful stories with us, Eric. And I want to thank everyone for watching. And we will see you next time.